Hi guys, Rachel Cook, Doctor of Audiology at Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona. And in today's video, we're talking all about hyperacusis. Coming up. As humans, we are surrounded by sound all day long. From the soft sounds of a clock ticking to the loud sounds of a jet flying overhead, sound comes in all different intensity levels and frequency ranges. Just how you perceive these sounds is dependent on something called your dynamic range. Think of dynamic range like this. Each person has their own audible window, ranging from the softest sounds they can just barely hear all the way up to the loudest sounds that they can tolerate. Above the top of this window, sounds become uncomfortable or even painfully loud. Below the bottom of this window, sounds become so soft you can no longer hear them. For most individuals, the upper limit of comfort, indicated by the U symbol, resides around 100 decibels HL. We can almost all agree that sounds that loud could make you wince or even stick your fingers in your ears out of reflex. But for some individuals, the volume level of sound becomes uncomfortable at much lower levels than 100 decibels, making normal environmental sounds like a door closing, a dog barking, or the click of heels walking across the floor unbearable. This is a condition called hyperacusis, an increased sensitivity to everyday sounds, making them seem louder and more bothersome than they are to the average person. And just to be clear, this is not just annoyance or discomfort with loud noises. Hyperacusis can be a disabling response to average level sounds. Hypersensitivity to sound can impact your social life and relationships, work, and can even impact your ability to complete regular everyday tasks like driving a car or shopping for groceries. Hyperacusis can often lead to anxiety, depression, social isolation, and even phonophobia, which is an actual fear of normal sounds. And if this is starting to sound familiar, you may be thinking of a similar sound sensitivity disorder called misophonia, which is the hatred of everyday sounds like breathing, chewing, or clicking a pen. Hyperacusis, misophonia, and even tinnitus all fall under the category of sound sensitivity disorders, and treatment options for each of these conditions are very similar. If you or someone you love has hyperacusis, then you know just how truly debilitating this condition can be. That's why today I'll be explaining the cause, diagnosis, and treatment options for managing hyperacusis. But before we dive in, if you could please take a second to give this video a thumbs up, it really helps bring videos like these to a wider audience. And while you're at it, please take a moment to hit the subscribe button with notification bell so that you never miss any one of our newly released videos. The prevalence of hyperacusis is not as well documented as other hearing-related conditions, but researchers estimate it affects about 1 in 50,000 people. Hyperacusis can develop suddenly or gradually, and your level of disturbance from sound can range from frequently bothersome to fully disabling. Researchers and scientists are still investigating the cause of hyperacusis, but it is likely due to a combination of factors, including damage to the auditory system, loud noise exposure, ototoxic medications, migraine, anxiety disorders, head injury, and PTSD. Experts theorize that hyperacusis may be due to a physical malfunction of protective mechanisms in the ear. One such mechanism is the acoustic reflex, a contraction of the stapedius muscle in response to loud sounds. The quick contraction of this muscle stiffens the middle ear system, limiting any additional volume that could be added on to incoming sounds. Some people with hyperacusis do not show the anticipated acoustic reflexes to loud sounds that are seen in individuals with normal hearing. Other theories include damage to a portion of the auditory nerve, problems processing sound in the brain, or an abnormal activation of the limbic system. The limbic system is the emotional center located in your brain. The limbic system is important for assigning emotional meaning to sounds, like the fear that comes with an unexpected clap of thunder. It is thought that hyperacusis can be triggered by emotional or physical trauma and can create an aversion to uncontrollable sounds that can startle the body's fight or flight reflex. While hyperacusis can begin with relatively mild symptoms, the condition can worsen without professional intervention. This should begin with a comprehensive hearing evaluation by a hearing healthcare provider who specializes in treating sound sensitivity disorders. Not all hearing healthcare providers have it within their scope of practice or expertise to diagnose and treat sound sensitivity disorders, so it's important to take the time to find one 
that does. This visit should begin with a significant medical history and symptom timeline to determine what symptoms you have, how severe they are, and when they started. This time is also spent identifying any other medical or psychological events that could have triggered or contributed to the problem. This information is used alongside questionnaires to determine the impact hyperacusis has on your daily life and decide upon next steps for testing. In many cases, the next step for diagnosing hyperacusis is through a hearing test. Perhaps the most insightful components of a hearing test for hyperacusis are the loudness discomfort levels, also known as the uncomfortable loudness levels. This test involves the use of a steady tone slowly turned up until the patient indicates that this sound has become uncomfortably loud. As stated earlier, a person with normal hearing can have uncomfortable loudness levels around 100 dBHL, but with hyperacusis, these can be as low as 50 to 60 decibels, the volume of a very average level conversation. As you can imagine, this can make nearly any environment outside of the home and even within the home incredibly distressing. For this reason, many individuals stop engaging in the activities that they enjoy due to the anxiety and discomfort that the unpredictable sound scene might bring. As a temporary way to navigate the demands of everyday life, you may find quick relief in the use of earplugs, over-the-ear ear muffs, and even noise-canceling headphones. But the main goals of hyperacusis management are to lessen the anxiety and fear of sound, learn to cope with uncomfortable sounds, and reduce sound sensitivity. While hearing protection may offer brief symptom relief, it does not address the underlying issue of the brain's response to sound. In many cases, it can actually make your sensitivity to sound worse as the brain adjusts to these lower levels of sound. In fact, most audiologists will advise against using hearing protection for managing hyperacusis, except in the acute treatment phase of more severe cases. And of course, when used as directed for protection against damaging levels of sound, like concerts and gunfire. Instead, sound therapy is the most proven form of hyperacusis management. Although it sounds ironic, sound therapy is the gradual exposure to low level, tolerable, and even pleasurable sounds with the goal of increasing their volume over time. This is done to try and gradually desensitize your brain's reactivity to higher volume sounds. Oftentimes, this includes the use of noise generators producing various colors of noise, like white noise or brown noise, that also help by softening the impact of any abrupt noises that occur. Sound therapy can be delivered through tabletop speakers, white noise machines, and in severe cases, or in those with hearing loss, Sound therapy can even come from hearing aids. Hearing aids programmed to treat sound sensitivity disorders are sometimes called ear-level sound generators and are often in the form of a receiver and canal style instrument. These devices often include the use of custom programs with different sound therapy options, like white noise, ocean waves, or soothing tones. Ear-level sound generators offer the flexibility of being able to take sound therapy with you all day long, without having that sound bother or disturb anyone around you. The goal of sound therapy here is to reduce sensitivity to everyday sounds and to rebuild sound tolerance. And if you want to learn more about effective sound therapy, be sure to check out my video that I'll have linked in the description below. Another effective way to manage hyperacusis, often delivered alongside sound therapy, is counseling. This is almost always needed to manage the emotional reactivity, anxiety, and discomfort around sound. In particular, cognitive behavioral therapy is completed with the aim to change negative thought patterns and behaviors related to sound sensitivity. This recommendation is especially true for those that have or are currently experiencing emotional or psychological distress. This can impact the way your brain assigns safety ratings to all sorts of incoming signals, including sounds. So please do not delay in scheduling a consultation with a psychologist. In some severe cases, medication like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, otherwise known as SSRIs, or anti-anxiety medication can be prescribed to manage the emotional reactivity that comes with hyperacusis. And finally, Support groups such as the Hyperacusis Network publish resources and exchange information on internet forums 
to find solutions. While very rare, there are a broad range of causes for reduced tolerance of sound. If you experience discomfort or even pain from sounds that most people regard as normal, everyday sounds, you need to seek care. It is critical to begin with a comprehensive hearing evaluation from an audiologist who specializes in managing sound sensitivity disorders. Depending on the severity of your symptoms, you may also benefit from some acute counseling to manage anxiety. Working with your audiologist, a sound therapy plan should be developed using sound generators and your follow-up visits should be scheduled. Overall, hyperacusis management is achievable with a specialized care team and some strategies to keep you in control of your reactivity to sound.